good to uh, see the house of the Lord full today, and especially on this uh, high Sabbath communion today, and uh, uh, wonderful to see our, some guests here today, and, and our regular folk. Uh, we're uh, studying God's Word now, amen? This is uh, my favorite time uh, to, to delve into God's Word, and uh, we've been, uh, just started a new sermon series. Uh, and uh, you remember when we first started with this series, we, uh, we looked at this text from John chapter 14, verse 6. And uh, it's kind of a, a foundational text to this series. And, and Jesus said simply, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except what? Except through me. That's right. So, so this, this verse really wraps up what this series is all about. We want to follow the way, right? Who is Jesus to find the truth, which is Jesus, in order to receive eternal life, which also comes from Jesus. That's right. Uh, and so how, how do we follow Jesus? You see, this is where the Christian community gets confused. Everybody agrees that Jesus is the way, but then we get confused on how, how we follow him. How do we follow Jesus if he is the way? Well, the, the Bible tells us in, um, in the book of Psalms, this is our other foundational text for this series, uh, the, the psalmist says here, your way, O Lord, is where? In the sanctuary. That's right. So, so Jesus is the way, and according to the Psalms, the way is what? Is in the sanctuary. Thus, Jesus, the way, must be modeled through the, through the sanctuary. That's right. Uh, and so everything in the sanctuary points to Jesus. Jesus fulfilled it all during his life. So if we follow Jesus, we will be automatically following him through what? Through the sanctuary. That's right. So, so this series is entitled The Blueprint. It's about following Jesus through the sanctuary. Amen? And, and so that we can all know the, the truth uh, and, and how to attain eternal life. And so today's message is part three in our series. It's entitled, The Two Trees. The Two Trees. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have today to delve into your word. We pray that your spirit will be here amongst us in a mighty way, Lord. Convict us where we need to be convicted. Us. Encourage us where we need to be encouraged, Lord. And continue to instruct us uh, so that we can be ready for you when you come, Lord. So my prayer now is that you speak through me. This is all of our prayers now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, what is the greatest gift God has given to mankind? Just think about it for a second. Kind of, uh, this is not rhetorical. I actually want you to, to think about an answer for this one. Um, and, and, you know, some might say, some might say life. That's a pretty good gift, right? Give us life. Some might say love. But, but, just think about it, maybe uh, for a second, uh, and, it, and if you're brave, uh, just, uh, just tell the person next to you what, 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 what comes to your mind right away when you think of the greatest gift that God has given us. Just, just share real quick with the person next to you, if you don't mind, just, just, to, just as a thinking exercise here, and, and see you know, what, 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 we, what we get, what kind of answers we get. It, was the answer the, the same from the person that you gave, or did you guys come up with different ones? <laughs> probably, probably different ones. Um, now, this is no, I, I am in no way uh, uh, saying that this is what, you know, I can prove this, but I have my own theory about what the greatest gift that, that God has given us. And, and I truly believe the greatest gift God has given us is the power of, of choice. The power of choice. Um, did anybody else think that by any chance? A couple people? All right, cool. You get an A. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Good. No, but like I said, this is just my opinion, okay? I'll, I'll, make, a, I'll make my own theory here, thesis based by, I think this, but uh, no, but, but think about it. Would life be a gift without the power to choose how to live? Would love be a gift if we didn't have the freedom to choose to love or not to love? You see, without choice, 
we would lose all of our individuality. We, we would lose all of our spontaneity. And, and in, in fact, we would lose the, the majority of our complexity. What, what makes us so interesting, what makes people so interesting, is the fact that we are who we are because of a series of millions of choices that we have made throughout our life. And the choices that we have made have made us into the man or woman we are today. You know, one of uh, pop culture's most iconic illustrations of choice comes from the 1999 science fiction classic, The Matrix. The Matrix. Uh, did, you, did you find that picture yet for me, Josiah? Or not yet? Well, if he, if he does, that's great. If not, uh, some of you may remember it. Some of you maybe you haven't seen the movie. But uh, in the movie, the, there's this main character, and, and his name is Thomas Anderson. Uh, and uh, this, he, he's basically uh, this, this kind of computer programmer, and, and uh, he, he's, you know, got very unsatisfied with life, and, and, and all of a sudden he finds this, uh, this clue, or I don't exactly remember how he gets to the point, but the point is, is that, that he, he finds out that there's, there's this knowledge out there that, that has been being withheld from the majority of people living on the earth. And, and so, uh, eventually he gets to the point where he has to make a choice. He has to make a choice. And, and so, he, he comes before this character called Morpheus, and, and Morpheus kind of has in his hand, he has a, a red pill in one hand and a blue pill in the other. And, and basically, if he chooses the red pill... so to speak. And, and, and by doing so, he will become disconnected from this, from this matrix, this make-believe world that, that uh, everyone's living in. Uh, but if he chooses the blue pill, then he remains connected to the matrix and, and, he, and his memory gets erased and he goes back to kind of living a happy life here on this world, kind of ignorant about what's really going on. So, Basically, at this moment, his choice is determining his destiny. Uh, now, we're going to get back to this in a minute. But, but what we see here is a, this, this story in The Matrix is, is really a parallel to a, a story that we find in the book of Genesis. Uh, you see, instead of two pills in the book of Genesis, we find what? Two, two trees, don't we? Two trees. So... So um, let's go back uh, to, to Genesis. And uh, of course, Jacob did a wonderful job of reading our, our scripture. And that's really where we're going to right away here is, in, is Genesis chapter 2. And, uh, and we see here in Genesis chapter 2 that, that when God created this world, he, he also created a garden, right, for Adam and Eve to live in. And in this garden... There was the tree of life, right? Um, and, and the Bible tells us here in Genesis 2 that there's this tree of life. And also in the garden, there was not just the tree of life, but there was also the what? Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, uh, you can see that as long as he partook of the tree of life, then he would automatically what? Live forever, right? That's why it's called the tree of life. But if he wanted the knowledge of good and evil, God told him that if he partook of that fruit of that tree, what would happen? He would surely die. Okay, I'm not going to read it again because we just read it, Jacob read it through twice. But, but you see, um, so it's interesting. So after, right after God creates Adam and Eve, he is, God immediately gives them the power of what? Power of choice, yeah. Get the power of choice. They can either choose life or they can choose death. Now, we see here that God basically gave Adam and Eve the opportunity to break their connection with him anytime they wanted to, right? The, the, the way that they would do it simply was by doing what? Going in and taking from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, 
So what do the existence of these two trees teach us about God? What do these, what does these existence teach, of these two trees teach us about God? Well, for one, I believe it teaches us that God doesn't create robots. Amen? You know, God creates free moral beings, and, and he gives those free moral beings the opportunity to serve him out of love or to not serve him, right? So, and also we learn that in order to love, God is willing to risk what? Rejection, right? Yeah. See, see in, in, when God created us as free moral beings, there was no guarantee that we would choose him. But yet he did it anyway because love cannot exist without choice. Just like as some of you are parents today. You chose to be parents and you hoped that your children would love you in return for your love. But is there a guarantee? No. There's no guarantee. Uh, because the, the, the child eventually grows up and they can make their own choices. Um, and so we're, we're not told for how long, but for a while, Adam and Eve continued to choose life. They avoided that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But one day we were told that Eve does what? She's kind of wanders off a little bit here, gets a little bit close to the tree, and, and all of a sudden she finds herself in the presence of a talking serpent. Sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? <laughs> So, so here we are, she she's walks by the tree and all of a sudden the serpent starts talking to her. So let's read there, let's go to Genesis chapter 3, we will read this together. Genesis chapter 3, and let's start in verse 1. Now it says, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Eve hears a lie. She hears a lie. What the serpent is telling her is the exact opposite of what God has said, right? God has said, if you eat it, you will surely die. And the serpent said, you, you will not surely die. So imagine that, never hearing a lie in your life and being confronted with it for the first time. Uh, so, basically, uh, the serpent is telling her that God is trying to keep something from her that is in her own best interest. He, he creates in her a desire for the forbidden, a desire for the unknown, a desire for something that must be good or else why would God say, don't, don't partake of it? Yeah. So, according to the, the serpent, if she eats of this fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, she will become enlightened. She will have special knowledge. She will be brought into a higher state of being. She will be like, according to the serpent, like who? Like God. Wow. God must be holding, wanting to hold her down. So, if she takes this, then, wow, she's going she's gonna to go up to that next level. So, so the serpent is essentially holding out in his hand the red pill and the blue pill. If you want to put that back up on the screen again. You see, if she takes... She has the power to choose, so what choice will she make? Let's keep reading in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree 
was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye. Rebellion in an effort to reach a higher existence through the supposed freedom that sin provides. You see, just as Thomas Anderson was disconnected from the matrix after taking the red pill, so Adam and Eve became disconnected from God after what? Taking the forbidden fruit. Notice here, we keep reading. In verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were what? What is he? He's naked. He's naked. He didn't know it, but now he realized. How many were always chasing after him? Thomas Anderson, how many? There was three, right? How many is in the Godhead? Three. So where does God, who's, God is going after Adam and Eve, and what are they doing? Running away. And, if the, and the whole movie is about Thomas Anderson running away from, uh, from the Matrix. So, you see, Neo, the Matrix is, everything is twisted. In the movie, The Matrix, everything's twisted upside down. Morpheus, the good guy, the mentor for Thomas Anderson, who was later renamed Nemo, is in fact the serpent. He's the devil. Neo finds freedom from God after taking the red pill and successfully wages war against him. God is portrayed as a tyrant and his laws a suffocating burden on mankind. This is in fact what the Gnostics taught and believed. The matrix is a, the gospel that, according to the Gnostics. And it's interesting, it's the same argument Lucifer made. When we Remember last time we were together, we studied this, the rebellion in heaven, right? The same argument Lucifer made to deceive a third of the angels in heaven from their allegiance to God. God's laws are not fair. They are what? Restrictive. You will find freedom when you what? Disconnect yourself from God and go your own way. This has been the devil's lie since the beginning, and now we see it portrayed in multiple Hollywood movies portraying this Gnostic gospel, portraying God as the tyrant and the devil as our friend. So what was God to do? What was God to do? Is God a tyrant? Is God just trying to crack the whip on us? To keep us in line? Why did he create us to begin with? You know, God didn't create us in order to control us. God created us in order to have a relationship with us. An intelligent relationship where we give our allegiance to him and he gives everything of himself to us. So the only thing God could do was decide to give himself to pay the price. To reconnect us back to himself. And we see that unfolding right here in the book of, of, of Genesis. We see this picture of God. What, what he wants to do. If we continue reading in verse 3. Notice verses 14 and 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, because you were... You are cursed more than all.
woman who would eventually become who? Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ would come and stomp on the head of the, sa uh, of, of the serpent, thus putting an end to the devil's reign and freeing us from his grasp. You know, if we... Uh, But, but there was consequences. There were still consequences to, to that decision that Adam and Eve made, right? You know, just as the devil and his angels were booted out of heaven after they sinned, Adam and Eve had to face some consequences of their own. If you look at the end of chapter 3, at the end of chapter 3, notice verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put... You see... Because of the, the result of taking that red pill, the, our natures have completely, what? Completely changed, right? Yeah. God, and, and, and so we no longer have access to the tree of life anymore, right? So the inevitable result of that is disease, decay, and death. And, and so some might be tempted to wonder, well, how could such a small sin result in such horrendous consequences for the human race? But we, if we understood the fundamental change that took place in our nature as a result of taking that pill, there would be no doubt. There would be no doubt. Because if we go to the New Testament in Romans, Romans chapter 8, We find that things couldn't just go back to the way, to normal, because of this, of this change here that took place. Notice Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things... No matter, we, we, our, our natures have changed to the point that we are at what? With God, according to that text? Enmity means what? We're at war. Yeah. We're at war with him. Our natures, therefore, because of that red pill, are now what? At war with God. And therefore, even if we wanted to do what was right, we couldn't. So the moment they ate that fruit, they joined the devil in his rebellion, right? And, and so, sin, the experiential knowledge of it, became the fabric of their being. That's why when we look in the New Testament in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, when God says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, for sin is what? Lawlessness, it's transgression of the law. So we had this, this, this promise in, in, um, of a Savior, but the reality was that that promise did not help us unless we accepted it, right? Because the natural consequences of eating a, the, taking that red pill was that we were what? Booted out. Our natures had changed, that we were at war with God, and, and, uh, and then, like Bill said, we were eventually going to die. And so, the only way that, that God could, could bring us back, so to speak, he had to come up with this, with this plan 
of redemption, right? This plan of redemption. You see, a plan which, which our sins could be forgiven of rebellion, our natures could be recreated, and our free communion with God in Eden could be restored. You've probably heard the terms before. Justification, sanctification, glorification. That, that was God's plan. And so, right there in the garden, he had already promised the life of his son, right? The life of his son to pay the price of our redemption. But we see that it wasn't just promised to them that day. There was actually an illustration of it. I don't, maybe some of you have never caught this before. But the illustration of the plan of redemption happened on the very same day that they sinned. If you go to Genesis 3 and verse 21... Genesis verse 3, chapter 3 and verse 21. Notice what it says here. And also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made what? Tunics of skin and clothed them. Where do you think that skin came from? <laughs> yeah. There was the death of an animal that day, wasn't there? Yeah. So, so God forgave their sin and clothed their nakedness with the sacrificial offering of this lamb. That very day. Jesus is the lamb. Jesus is the way. The way is in the sanctuary. Jesus not only forgives our sins, but also covers our nakedness. However, we must choose to accept it, right? Each one of us has a choice to make every day. Each one of us has a blue pill and a red pill that's put before us every day when we get up. And the choice that we make, either accepting the sacrifice of Christ and putting on His righteousness, right? If we choose that, then we can be on His side. We can live the whole day on his side, in his team. But if we don't make that choice, if we continue to say, no, I'm, I'm going to choose the red pill today, I'm going to choose my own way, my own will, my own life, then <laughs> we're going to live that day at enmity with God. Instead of running towards him, we're going to be what? Running away from him. And we're going to think that he's the enemy. When he's actually out not to, to arrest us, but he's coming after us in order to save us. So we can be like Thomas Anderson and choose to rebel. Or we can be like Joshua who said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yeah? And what is the reward for accepting the sacrifice of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins? You know, it was future for them, but for us it's what? It's past. They were looking forward to the, to the death of Christ. We're looking back in faith. But both are saved by faith. You see, the reward of accepting Jesus and allowing him to forgive our sins, cover our nakedness with his righteousness, Notice, if we go to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation. Chapter 22. And verse 14. When we choose to be forgiven, when we choose to be covered, notice what it says. Blessed are those who what? And guaranteed for us. Everything will go back to what it should have been before in the end. We will again be eating from that tree of life. We will again be living forever. And the way that we get there is following Jesus through the sanctuary. Amen? And that begins by accepting him 
of what he's done for us on the cross. And so that's what communion's about, friends. Uh, when we take of these emblems today, it, it's really about saying no to the red pill and yes to the, to the blue pill. It's about, yes, I want to not disconnect myself from God, but I want to what? I want to stay connected. I want to stay connected to the life source. The body and the blood of Jesus. I want that forgiveness of sin. I want that covering of, 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 of my nakedness so that I can one day walk in heaven with him and partake of that tree of life. Amen? That, that's what we're doing today. We're, we're making that choice. And so let's not make this a, like uh, Renee was saying, just something uh, that we do out of tradition, but let's really, truly experience that connection with God today as we partake. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, your unrelenting love for us, Lord, your unrelenting seeking after us, Lord. You're not our enemy, Lord, you're our Savior. Help us to stop believing that going our own way is where the happiness lies. Lord, if, if anyone here today is, is struggling um, to come back to you, Lord, I, I pray that you will just impress into their hearts that, that true freedom comes not from rebellion but from obedience, Lord. Um, and, and Lord, that your greatest uh, desire is for our joy and happiness. Um, and so, Lord, may we, may we put aside our, our own um, our own wills, Lord, and Lord, may we surrender them to you today so that you can live in us, Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, at this point, we're going to um, partake in the ordinance of humility. Um, if you're not familiar with that, um, it's a